Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Sheldon Brown, the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination here at UCSD. And uh, tonight is another, uh, another episode of our sci-fi flick series. And uh, tonight we're, we, have the, we have Sleep Dealer, along with a conversation afterwards with the director, Alex Rivera, who's here with us tonight. Um, so tonight's film is also being shown in, a, in affiliation with the course Are We Alone, which has been developed by uh, Clark Center affiliated faculty as part of the Sixth College of Art, Culture, and Technology's course sequence. So right now there's five classes with 1,000 students approximately being taught this quarter with a shared curriculum around this question of Are We Alone? And teasing that apart and in all of its dimensions. Who, who is this we? And what does it mean to be alone? And what does that mean at the biological scale and at the social scale and at the cosmological scale? Um, so it has this interdisciplinary group of faculty from physics, art, literature, and social sciences uh, asking this question. And so tonight's program, like uh, many of our programs, all of our film programs, wouldn't be possible um, without the people that support the Clark Center, including our uh, founding corporate partner, Viasat, um, our Founders Orbit members, and the Ray Thomas Edwards Foundation. And this particular program has also been supported by departments across the campus, including Six College, the Office of the Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, the Divisions of Social Sciences and Arts and Humanities, Marshall College, the Department of Literature, and the Department of Ethnic Studies. And the person responsible for wrangling all those people together is the person I'll introduce now, who's uh, Dr. Shelley Streeby, who's a professor in Ethnic Studies and Literature and director of the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop that we host here every summer. And uh, Shelley will introduce the program and the guests tonight uh, right now. So Shelley. Thanks, Sheldon. It's great to see you guys uh, out there, uh, especially the students in my uh, six college Cat 3 class. And also I'm teaching this film in Doc 3, Imagination, for Thorogood Marshall's college. And so I see a bunch of Marshall uh, students here tonight as well, which I'm really glad to see. Uh, so we're delighted to be showing uh, Sleep Dealer tonight, a Sundance award-winning sci-fi thriller packed with stunning visuals and strong social and political themes. So we'll be watching the film, which is about an hour and a half long, and then we'll be moving directly into a discussion with the director of the film, Alex Rivera. And uh, Cat3 and Doc3 students who are writing this event up, be sure to stay clear through to the end because we want to hear about what you think about the question and answer uh, period that follows. So the film raises big questions uh, about the future of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and the world. And the great science fiction writer Samuel Delaney once defined science fiction as a genre that uses the narrative device of the future to imagine significant distortions of the present. So in my Cat 3 and Doc 3 classes this quarter, we've been talking a lot about how Sleep Dealer imaginatively distorts our U.S.-Mexico borderlands present and extrapolates from problems in the present to warn us about what might happen in the future if we don't uh, make changes. And the film imagines a deepening of current inequalities produced by new forms of globalization and takes up questions that matter now, such as struggles over the privatization of water and the use of drones. So Rivera's focus on imagining a future of labor and the borderlands built out of elements from our present also raises important questions about more utopian visions of technological change and progress and also the transcendence of the body uh, in future labor context. So Rivera is a filmmaker who for the past 15 years has been telling new, urgent, and visually adventurous Latino stories. Sleep Dealer, his first feature film, won awards at the Sundance Film Festival and the Berlin International Film Festival, was screened at the Museum of Modern Art, and had a commercial release in the US, France, Japan, and other countries. Uh, Alex is also a Sundance Fellow, a Rockefeller Fellow, and was named one of Variety Magazine's 10 directors to watch. 
So after the film, Curtis uh, Mares, Dr. Curtis Mares, the chair of ethnic studies, will be in conversation with Alex. And uh, Dr. Mares's research and teaching focus on race and popular culture and media, with a particular emphasis on U.S. Latinos. So that will be great, and I hope you all stick around for that. Um, I also just wanted to point out the Sci-Fi Flick series will continue this summer, so stay tuned for the Clark Center website for more details. And we also have a panel tomorrow on Latino science fiction, which I'm really excited about. Alex will be a part of that, also Curtis Mares and uh, Rosara Sanchez and Beatriz Pita, who are the authors of the novel Luna Braceros, 2125-2148, which is getting a lot of buzz and is really interesting to think about in relationship to this film. So that's going on tomorrow at the Cross-Cultural Center from 3 to 4.30 if people want to join that event. And then I also wanted to point out that next week we have another uh, event, the culminating event for the Are We Alone classes will be uh, an event that goes from 5 to 8 next Wednesday. And a lot of us who've been teaching the class will be there, a lot of special guests doing performances and creating art specifically for this event. And we'll also have uh, the famous science fiction writer Jeff Vandermeer uh, there, who's been nominated for a lot of awards this year and is getting a lot of attention for his trilogy, The Southern Reach trilogy. The first um, novel in that trilogy is Annihilation, and all three novels were on the New York best, uh, Times bestseller list this summer. So I think it's going to be a great event. We hope we'll see some of you there. Uh, for now, uh, thanks for coming, and enjoy the movie. All right. Well, uh, uh, thanks for sticking around. I guess we'll uh, uh, go ahead and, and get started. First, uh, just by thanking Alex for making this amazing uh, film uh, that we can all uh, enjoy and, and learn from. Um, I don't know if people have, uh, have seen it before. I've seen it uh, a zillion times. Uh, I see something new uh, every time. And the one thing I wanted to comment on now that made me so happy uh, is, the, is the ending of the film, which, you know, especially in dark times, reminds us that sometimes the Death Star does get destroyed. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we win. Uh, and so it's, it's just good to, to, uh, to have some of that kind of uh, utopian energy uh, along with a good dose of, of the dystopic. Uh, so I wanted to start just by asking a couple of questions of Alex and uh, before we open it up, uh, especially hoping that some students are going to ask some questions. Uh, so uh, the first thing, let's see. The last movie I saw and really liked that was set in the greater San Diego, Tijuana area was uh, called Mr. Wrong, starring Ellen before she came out. Uh, uh, I highly recommend it if people want to see a San Diego movie. Uh, but so San Diego, Tijuana region is not a place that a lot of movies are made. Could you just maybe say a little bit for our hometown audience about, you know, about the region, how you chose that area and what it meant to you? Sure. Well, first off, I want to say thank you guys all for coming out. Thank you to, uh, to Shelley Strebe and to the organizers of the event for bringing me out. Um, you know, I've been coming to UC San Diego mm -hmm. since... You know, the first time I was here was probably 1996 with uh, my early short films. And so this place has always felt kind of like a home to me. Um, and so it's just great to be here. And now with the Arthur C. Clarke Center, that seems also like a, a space that uh, is exciting to me. And it's a privilege and a delight to be part of it. So thank you for having me. Um, and in terms of yeah, setting the film here in this region, right? Um, you know, I, I'm a New Yorker. Um, uh, from a Peruvian and Irish family. My, my, my dad's from uh, Lima, my mom's from Brooklyn, but of Irish descent. And uh, when I started to make work, I, I looked first close to home, which is what a lot of artists do, right? And I looked at my dad's life and realized that he was living in a kind of borderland. It's uh, the people who wrote about the border, Gloria Ansaldúa, people who made art about it, uh, Guillermo Gómez Peña, Lourdes Portillo, um, those artists impacted my way of thinking and seeing my own family. So even though we were geographically in New York, when I looked at my dad's conundrum, his situation of having left um, his family far behind, his language and uh, many aspects of his culture far behind to come to the US and work, ending up in New York, well, and, um, and his use of the television, because when I was a child, there was obviously no internet. What there was was the TV, and my dad used the TV very powerfully, six hours, eight hours a night, to connect to the Spanish-speaking world. He would watch hours and hours of Univision, right? And so when I started to look at my family as an artist, that was what I saw. I saw my dad kind of living in a, a digital or an informational borderland 
was how I conceived of it. So his body being in New York, but his, his mind and his consciousness kind of traveling through these mediated forms back to his past and back to a different landscape. So the border kind of snuck into my, my life through engaging with these other artists' work and trying to understand my family. So it's a very natural thing at a certain point to say, I want to go and see the, this border. I want to see the border. And Tijuana was the first place that I, I came and got to see the actual point of contact between um, the U.S. and Mexico. It was the first border town. San Diego, Tijuana, San Ysidro, Tijuana um, uh, was the first place I came. And uh, ever since then, it's had a grip on my, my consciousness. You know, it's such a um, incendiary landscape. It's a landscape of such extraordinary contrasts, um, you know, you, and, um, and so it just it's always seemed very cinematic to me. I, I don't know why you wouldn't set more films here. It's a landscape that's so singular and so special, and yet I think it's a landscape, and this is the last thing I'll say, that makes visible our condition, which is often invisible. When what I mean by that is that even though maybe you might live in Iowa, you're a border person. If you live in, you know, Florida, North Dakota, anywhere in our contemporary reality is a borderland. And what I mean by that is if you take off your clothes, for example, right, which I've, I've heard happens at UC San Diego, <laughs> but, which I fully support, but in any case, but if you take them off and read the labels, right, what, is, what, what do the labels say? It says things like Vietnam, Indonesia, China. If you take the, the technology that's in your lap and look where that was made, everything we touch these days, almost everything we touch is produced in this global matrix um, all around the world and produced and conditions of labor that have been made illegal here. And so they're produced over there. And these goods are shipped back and forth. Information is shipped. We, we live in this age where we are all kind of border inhabitants. Things that enable our lives are produced through these conditions of tremendous contrast. You know, and um, those systems depend on being invisible and being kind of hidden. So when you go to the, the gap, you don't see, you see pictures of smiling people. You don't see pictures of where the clothes come from, right? So that invisibility of that other landscape enables our political and social order. But when you go to this border here, this San Diego, Tijuana, it's such a striking landscape because it's right there. So you have the so-called first world, the kind of luxury and even opulence of San Diego, La Jolla, etc. Incredible wealth and power. And then right one inch away, you know, the communities we filmed in, which was called Nido de las Aguilas, where Memo lives in, in my film, right, is a shanty town. Uh, and that's a, obviously a real shanty town that we filmed in. And the people who live in those houses that are made of old shipping pallets are not destitute people. They're not homeless people. They're, like Memo, they're workers. Mostly, you talk to them, they work in the Toshiba factories and the, you know, that, that's, that's, so when we are sitting in our living rooms watching a high def TV, we are in that shanty town. We are connected to that place, you know, but the system we live in pushes, tries to push that off of our radar, tries to make that invisible. And why I think Sleep Dealer needed to be set here is because it's such a kind of combustible landscape where you can have those exchanges and those contacts right there so Rudy can drive from this reality into that one. It's harder to drive from here to Guangdong province in China, right? <laughs> but the dynamic is similar between here and, and Tijuana in terms of these economic um, kind of connections and separations. But what's different is here it's, it's, it's an inch away. And so it makes it a, a spectacular um, landscape for film and specifically for science fiction. And it's kind of like uh, borders on steroids because that scene uh, when, when Rudy is crossing the border, I'm hearing a, a South Asian accent on uh, uh, the machine that is questioning him. So it's as though US border security has been outsourced like a call center, right? Uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, so that's really, that's really great. And the other thing I just was going to pick up on is the uh, talking about your dad and the TV just kind of reminds me at some point talking with you, talking about ideas of uh, a virtual co-presence, uh, which sounds very science fictional and could be used to describe um, uh, the kind of labor experiences we see here, where, where people are present in two places uh, at the same time, physically in one place and virtually at the same time. And that's always struck me as even without the high-tech mediation 
uh, the way in which a lot of uh, uh, migrant experiences work is uh, in a way that sort of reminds me of your film, um, The Six Section, which mm -hmm. is not science fictional at all. It's a documentary, but it's about a group of, uh, of Mexican migrant workers in New York who are effectively the sixth section of their village back in, in Mexico. They have a kind of uh, one foot uh, in, in both places at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a really, a really, yeah. cool, uh, a really cool idea. Um, well, the other thing that, that struck me, especially this time, is I love the scene uh, which hopefully resonated with a, a bunch of folks here where, where uh, Luz comes home and she has that voicemail message from uh, the evil college administrator, uh, apparently, who uh, is going to come and confiscate all of her goods because of her student debt. <laughs> um, and so for me, uh, uh, one of the things that's been interesting about this film in particular is it's had a real life on college campuses, uh, has really... Um, uh, for whatever reason, appeal to academic and student audiences. I don't, I, I don't know or imagine if that was the audience you were assuming, but I'm just curious if you could say something about, about the life of the film on college campuses. Sure. Well, yeah, and uh, I mean, so the, the film has had many different uh, li lives and, and near deaths, actually. It, uh, the film almost um, disappeared several years ago because the distributor that owned it went out of business, and when that happens, it's very dangerous for the film because it can just become an asset that just gets taken away, gets confiscated, <laughs> literally. Um, so we managed to get it back, but but really through through its the five or six years of its life now, it, it's it's always had this kind of presence in academia, and and, um, and it does seem to be growing, and it's that's a what can I say other than it's a delight for me? Um, but I mean, I think um, it also speaks to the fact that. You know, most of the way that we consume media, we consume media um, by ourselves so much. And obviously the screen's getting smaller and more mobile. You know, we consume media sitting at a table right across from other people. We consume it um, obviously in our, in our homes, but now in our beds, in our bathrooms. I mean, the media is everywhere. And, but the most powerful place for media to be is when we can watch it together and talk about it. And there's just not enough, you know, not enough venues like that. So the academic context is such a beautiful place um, to show this film and show, to show films in general. But I wanted to echo off of what, what you were mentioning about the, um, the idea of uh, migrant people kind of being in two places at once. And that to me has been one of the most interesting things about the film's life is a lot of um, people who've written about it and talk about it plug into the fact that it's coming true, you know, that the, uh, the technologies, the kind of uh, idea of remote labor um, that the film presents is sort of panning out in all of these ways. And, and what I take away from that is that, you know, my process was, like I mentioned, I started with my dad. I started with my cousins, looking at my cousins who are doing landscaping, who are doing construction, who are working in restaurants, and yet who are called illegals, right, who are called aliens. Um, and considering that fact, just the fact of, of a, a, a worker's life in, in the 1990s and a manual laborer and specifically the class of workers who were most excluded, undocumented workers, and excluded from uh, political participation, excluded from all kinds of protections, looking there and then opening my mind to science fiction. What I saw was this idea of like a phantom, a person who is present and yet absent, a person whose a, a, a dimension of them is welcome. The expression of labor is occurring, the buildings are being built, food is being prepared, children are being cared for. The labor is here and is woven into the fabric of our society, and yet we have a political regime that wants to kind of also erase that body. Um, criminalize that body. So this kind of being and non-being. And when I opened my mind to think about that state of being, of my cousin, of my father, etc., but then open it to a science fiction rhetoric, what I saw was this, like, this idea of the, the phantom worker. And um, what was interesting to me is to see that that has, like you could see the future by looking at the, that condition of the, uh, 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 of the person who's at the kind of, you know, bottom of the pyramid in a sense, the person whose labor enables the whole functioning of our society. Look there into the place that's supposed to be in the shadows and you find light. You find, by looking at the, the worker, you find the future of all of us, you know? And so that kind of um, alienation, that condition of alienation of the undocumented that I was thinking about in physical reality in the 90s 
is now a kind of haunting specter, I think, so many different classes of workers face in this decade through digitalization, right? So we're seeing cab workers facing this kind of very strange future through Uber and through autonomous vehicles. We're finding, you know, uh, doctors facing AI. Um, you know, so the kind of precarious, um, hyper-alienated state of being that you could get a whiff of in the 90s by looking at the manual labor class now is like sort of through digital, um, through all these kind of complex digital systems is now permeating across a society in, in, in all these ways. And so it's like, I felt like I was looking at the, uh, the canary in the coal mine, you know, right, was, right, was, right. was my family, you know? Right, right, right. It's gonna, so anyways. That's, that's perfect. I mean, well, you know, one of, the, one of the things that this makes me think of about, well, there are a variety of ways in which we can play the game with the film, like what, what did it predict, what, what, uh, what canary in the coal mine has become, you know, much more apparent now. Um, and a couple of things come to mind. One thing that, that comes to mind that I think really hooks up with, with the film is I've just learned about uh, low-wage workers, largely in the Philippines, who do content uh, moderation for YouTube and other kinds of sites. So what that means is um, uh, for, for first world consumers who don't want to see uh, violent imagery, don't want to see beheadings, don't want to see sexual imagery, don't want to see representations of extreme forms of racism, uh, low wage workers uh, scrub uh, parts of the internet uh, for that content. So they, they look at it so that, so that we don't have to. Um, and one of the, uh, uh, the occupational hazards of that kind of job, of course, is you can't do it very long because it's traumatic, it's devastating, it literally you know, sucks the life out of you in a way in which in, in this film that's what's really striking is that it reminds us that our consumption of virtual labor is, 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 is still actually sucking the life out of people just as, as Marx would say it did you know, in the 19th century, that uh, things have changed but things, uh, yeah. things quite uh, haven't. Uh, I mean other prescient things in the film um, that have really just uh, uh, taken off I think um, you were the first person who made me think about drones. Um, and uh, You're I'm welcome. Also, what's that? Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> they're in my nightmares now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> and also water, and also uh, yeah. especially now, given the drought that we're in, yeah. thinking about the kind of politics of water. So I'm just curious if you have thoughts about either of those uh, and how they've developed. Those issues have developed since sure, the film. Sure, sure. Well, the drone. I mean, the, the the drone question again. It just relates to what my very extended rant about alienation and that condition. You know of. Um, being here and not here. And when I came up with the kind of metaphor, the, the, the seed of this film was the idea of the telemigrant, the remote worker was the, the first idea. And when I started to write the script, I knew that he would be the protagonist. Then you need an antagonist. And so I just kind of flipped that around. So I said, I have this image of this guy working in Mexico controlling a machine here. What would be the, his opposite? You know, will it be maybe somebody here controlling a machine there? Okay, well, if someone in the U.S. is connecting to remote work, well, they're not going to be washing windows. That economically doesn't make sense. So, what what ways do 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 we cross borders? How are we border crossers here? You know, and so then there's you know tourism. There's uh, corporate executives who would cross borders to to uh, to run fa factories overseas, and then there's the military. You know, the, our our military um, has always been a migrant force. It's a border. It's a force that doesn't respect borders. Um, it's a it's a border jumper. You know, and so I had this image of the military force, uh, a military being, remotely sending his labor the other direction. And then it's, I kind of tripped. I said, wow, that's cool. It's kind of a circle, because I could have one guy in Mexico building a building in the US remotely, and a guy here knocking them down. You know, and, it's, and what if he knocked down the building that the worker used to live in, and you get this kind of circular flow. At a certain moment, I thought, Memo, you know, he's doing that construction, I, I had this idea that what if he was building a new office tower for the drone company? <laughs> I mean, too, it just seemed a little too cheeky at that point, but it, but in any case, there's a poetry to that kind of, yeah. that that kind of circuit, you know, and um, a horrible poetry, you know, violent poetry. But anyways, that's where the drone came from. But again, it's like the canary in the coma is reflecting on the state status of being an alienated worker, and then where is that going? How could technology enable and accelerate that? How will it enable and accelerate that? Um, 
that hunger for human um, energy, the hunger for labor, and yet this distaste for caring for the body, the distaste for caring for uh, the people who's from, from whom the labor comes. So anyways, reflecting on that, you get this kind of image of these um, alienated subjects torn apart by technology and yet connected by it, and in there is the drone. And so in the 90s, I started, had this image of the remote warrior and then it started to happen. You know, it happened 2003. Obviously, the drones have been a kind of military phenomena for half a century, but, um, but really became weaponized and, and then really hit the media very hard in 2003. And uh, it was kind of a creepy feeling when things start to, um, start to unf un un unfold that way. But I mean, I, I think we do live in, you know, Ricardo Dominguez and other folks here have been very active and kind of um, theorizing drone culture, Ricardo always says uh, dronology, you know, and this idea that we live in, um, the drone is no longer just the, the predator or the reaper, these kind of military machines, it's a kind of whole sense that time and space are being kind of disaggregated um, through, these, through these, uh, these technological connections, you know, and so I, I was reflecting on lunch, you know, when we drive cars, in a sense we're, you know, are we in a drone dynamic when we obey algorithms, you know, because we, it's so much part of now getting into a vehicle, we, we turn on the system and listen to it and obey it, in a sense, it's like it's the drone pilot, the algorithm is the drone pilot and we are the, the predator, the, you know, obeying these orders that we don't even know where they necessarily come from, but we, so, in any case, I mean, I think that's, um, yeah, a couple thoughts, <laughs> random that's thoughts. That's great. I mean, one of the things that's really <laughs> contradictory about this borderland space, and UCSD in particular, is that UCSD is both the center of drone production and drone critique mm -hmm. at the same time, which is kind of, uh, uh, kind of amazing. Um, well, maybe we should just uh, open the floor up to, uh, to some questions, see if people have any, uh, anything they'd like to ask uh, uh, Alex. Uh, yes, way in the back. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I think um, the uh, good, uh, let's see, virtual labor, telepresence. Um, no, I mean, I, my inspiration was just the, you know, the idea came to me in 1997. I made a short film that contained a lot of these ideas way back then. And so uh, the, uh, the notion of telepresence was just percolating in the media at that point. You know, we all had like stinky dial-up modems, you know, and could barely get a picture on the internet, but Wired Magazine was talking about, you know, oh, in the future, everyone's gonna work from home, you know, and this idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, Sheldon in his uh, introduction was talking about this idea of, are we alone? And he was saying, well, who is this we, you know, and what does it mean to be alone? Anyways, whenever I see that word, we, or everyone, I love to poke at that. And so when Wired Magazine was saying everyone could work from home, I love to say, well, who's this everyone? You know, let's think about that, really. And so I started to think about my cousins working from home, knowing that they'd traveled 5,000 miles to clean dishes in Jackson Heights and to do landscaping in Long Island, you know, like, what if they could work from home, I thought. And so I had this image of my cousins being in Peru and somehow beaming them their, their, their work from home, right, into New York. And well, there'd need to be a robot to manifest because it's manual labor. And um, there, whoa, I said, whoa, there's an idea, you know? <laughs> and I told my friend and he thought it was funny and I kept talking about it and then they it, it couldn't get it out of my head so they made a short film, you know, about that idea. But it came from interrogate, that word, from interrogating that word, everyone, you know, and the, these promises about what the future might hold, you know. Uh, yes, right here. Um, relating technology not only to work, but like to the social aspect of society, um, is there an implication that it um, sucks like our energy as well like in in mm. like society in general um, as well as like connecting um, everyone to each other like is there like a good and bad aspect is that like, the implication of the film yeah as well? I mean yeah I think I think that's right I mean the film you know it, it, 
obviously it's it's there for you to reflect on and take from it what what you'd like. For me, um, you know, when I wrote it, I was trying to communicate this kind of dialectical or dualistic um, reality, which is what I was perceiving or suspecting is that the technology would create these forms of alienation that we're talking about. The worker who can't ever walk in the building he's building. The uh, the drone pilot who's um, you know, killing people on a screen, etc. But obviously, the way the plot unfolds in Act Three, all of a sudden you start to see that those connections are not purely alienating. That Rudy, even though he's been perceiving his victims on this screen, he's felt something, and that's not—it's um, not hokey. That's reality. I don't know if folks that have been reading about the condition of the drone pilot. I'm, in our reality today, I've probably read that you know there's high instances of PTSD. Um, I met a researcher at a conference right here in this room who was doing incredible work um, in dialogue with military chaplains, you know, who have to give uh, spiritual guidance to the drone pilots because they're fraught with terrible feelings of guilt, just like my character, you know. And so, what and what is that? What does that teach us or show us? I mean, we can imagine the design work that happens around the corner here at General Atomics to build the Predator drone, they're not trying to make uh, a movie to make somebody sympathetic. They're building a machine to surveil and kill. That's it. But that system leaks. It leaks humanity. You know? It leaks sympathy and empathy. You know? And so the drone pilot who's in this box in the Nevada desert or whatever, ends up having feelings towards the person they're killing. You know, and so that just shows us right there that these technologies, they might have one intention which is very clear, but then they produce a, an aftershock which is not expected, you know. And so you get the alienation and connectivity. Um, you get distance and empathy uh, simultaneously, you know. And, then, and, then, and I hope the film kind of leaves you suspended in terms of which of those forces is going to gain more leverage, you know? Yeah. I saw a hand way in the back. Did you want to have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on the apparent irony or contradiction between while working the uh, teleoperation workers are trapped and uh, essentially immobile, imprisoned in the uh, workspace, whereas they can go anywhere and do anything yeah. through the system. I love that observation. Sure. I think that's, I mean, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what to say except that the, um, the body in our digital um, world is, uh, bodies are impacted very differently and in contradictory ways. So, you know, our, the technologies like that, that most of us in the room might have in our pockets, the cell phones, the tablets, the laptops, etc., are these technologies of great mobility and allow us to work in a cafe or work in our underpants in our bed or work in our yard and we can be like, hey, I'm other uh, images uh, uh, that they're always sold to us is of like people like, I'm buying and selling stocks on the beach, you know what I mean? It's like, you get an iPhone, you can work on the beach. I never work on the beach for some reason, even though I have all this technology. In any case, <laughs> you know, th those are the images that are sold to us. They're kind of like, disaggregating work and space. You can kind of be productive anywhere. And yet, you know, we obviously know that these machines are not on the other end of the chain that we're connected to. The human chain is factories with nets around them so people don't jump out and commit suicide. And where the workers live right next door to the factory. And they're not mobile. You know, they they're, they're, they're maybe migrate into that space, but these are kind of factory prisons that create these technologies of mobility, right? And, and um, so it's like very, you know, so both of those yeah. conditions are, are, are produced at the same time. That's just reminding me that the very first, before the, the South Asian call centers, the very first call center I ever read about was in a, a U.S. prison. So in the 80s and 90s, uh, if you would call the New Mexico State Tourism Board to, to, to plan your next trip to New Mexico, you would be talking to a New Mexico State penitentiary prisoner. 
Uh, so one could say that historically the origins of, of some of this kind of virtual work in the call centers really was in, uh, in prisons and then factories that are very prison-like. Yeah, and, uh, the, um, and there's been a bunch of interesting reporting on the, the Tijuana and the, the border call centers that have been absorbing a lot of the, the deported, uh, deported dreamers. That's right. That's deported right, yeah. Uh, yeah. young folks from, from here who, who speak English and um, end up over there. And I mean, it, that's, it's, you, you know, there's no, I mean, no, no need to add science fiction. Make a documentary and it's, you know, weirder than, than Blade Runner. I mean, that this country would be sweeping up people and expelling them and then into a system to welcome their, their digital labor back in. Uh, <laughs> it's just bananas. The, the last time I taught sleep dealer, one of uh, our graduating ethnic studies students had been as a young person deported back to Mexico his job was working in a call center. He said, that movie was me. I was, he was just like uh, blown away. So is there uh, uh, some more questions here? Uh, I think, the, how about in the, in the back there, the gentleman with the hand up? Oh, I'm sorry, okay, there we are. I can't see you behind this fellow's head. Um, I was wondering whether at some point you had thought, maybe I should include an, a different minority group or like include other minority groups? And if so, how would that have like uh, remodeled your story. My, um, minority groups, like within the, mm -hmm. I guess within the U.S., I suppose. Yeah. Or you mean mm -hmm. like, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I, um, you know, uh, one of the things I talk about every so often is just, you know, race and in filmmaking. And, you know, a lot of times when I go to like film schools, especially, they ask you, you know, are you always going to make Latino films, or is that what you want to do, or stuff like that. And, it's just. Um, you know, it's incredible how uh, how how race is only talked about in when you have black and brown characters, when you have so-called minority characters in the frame, then race becomes an issue, and it's not an issue if they're not in the frame. And you know, I would say like movies like you know the the, the Hangover or whatever; these are all movies that are incredibly imbued with with racial um, politics. It's in every, in every text, and as a director, as a filmmaker, you cast actors, and you have to, in our society, it's inevitable. You cannot cast someone who doesn't have a race, or doesn't, does not, not have a race, but participate in the race matrix. You know, it's a matrix, it's a myth, it's a history, but when you're casting people, you have to. Uh, you have to navigate that stuff. And so, when I had to cast the drone pilot, right, I mean, it was and write the drone pilot, um, was thinking about what type of person should they be? Man, woman, white, black, Latino, I mean, what, who, how is that going to be embodied? And I ended up going with Latino for, for two reasons. And one was to kind of, uh, I knew the character was going to go in a, an accelerated arc. He was like a supporting character, but in a way has the biggest journey. He goes from being a, a fresh-faced killer, happy to have my first day at work, I'm gonna be blowing people up, I'm very happy for it. It's like, you know, he's like nervous and, and it's his first day at work, and then by the end of the film, he's, he's like given everything up and he's crossed the border and hijacked a drone and blown some shit up and he's going off into the sunset. That's a big journey. And to sell that to the audience, I mean, one of my only things I held on to was this idea that he came from a Latino family, he spoke Spanish, he maybe it lurking inside him was a little bit of solidarity with the, with people on the other end of the screen for that reason, you know? So that was one reason to, to make him Latino. And then the other was, um, I thought if I had made him, him white, it would, um, he might be able to box the violence in a kind of, sim in, in, a, in a racial, in a simply racial scheme, and I kind of wanted to show how these systems of discipline and control absorb all of us. You know, they absorb us in, in different ways. They, they have a racial power to them, a racial component to them, but it is also simultaneously true that these systems of, of, of authority and discipline absorb the people who are their victims, you know? And so Latino people, my dad was in the infantry, um, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah, and so I wanted to just reflect on that. But making him African-American could have been very interesting, but I think it would have needed to be opened up somehow. You would have had, I, I would have wanted to explore that, and I didn't think there was, you know, it, there, there's other, other things, zillion other things going, too much other stuff going on, you know, 
So, yeah. I've lost the, the microphone. I guess, uh, I guess this fellow's had his hand up for a while here with the blue dot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Not on the forehead. You, you said this film was published uh, six years ago, yes? Yeah. So obviously the water crisis is more um, prominent now. Was the, the water crisis in this film kind of your vision of the future of it? Like every, everything was dammed up and there was no water for anyone and it was all protected? Was that your like vision of the future of the drought? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this, this film was conceived of in the 90s. And so my kind of overall framework coming out of that moment was that any question mark, the answer would be the free market. You know, Wh whatever, whatever the question is, let the market decide it. You know, and so like this, the, the laboring dynamic is so absurd and kind of sick and twisted, but makes great market sense. If you can imagine a kind of cheap robot and the subjectivity of a cheap worker, bzz, you know, okay, great. That's a more effective, you know, labor relationship. It's cheaper. In this world, we're going to do it. And there's no other concerns. And so every question mark in this film, what to do with memories, sell them. You know, what to do, you know what I mean? What to do with uh, water, sell it. Everything is for sale in this, in this movie. There's almost no government, you know what I mean? There's just a market. And it's a perfectly logical market. Um, and that, I think, is what's kind of creepy and, and, and what also has proven kind of true, you know, is it's like the mechanism in, in our society for solving any problem is the market. And, um, you know, and, and so anyways, so the water aspect of that made sense to me, and I think it's, it's unfolding, you know, roughly according to this image. Um, there's, was a, you know, um, and series of events in Bolivia that are kind of f famous that unfolded in a place called Cochabamba, where a company named Bechtel, which is an American company based in San Francisco, uh, set up a deal with the city government um, to privatize the water. And it was famous because they even said, we'll, we'll capture rainwater and that will be privatized. And, um, you know, and the people there uh, rose up and shut the city down with blockades, throw stones and sticks. And there was an uprising over the water. Uh, and the people shut the company down, ran them out of town. That's the rare instance. You know, all across this country, Nestle and other companies have been incredibly effective at going into places that have a lot of groundwater and just because we have this kind of notion of property where if you get the land, you get the water. They buy some land, put in a straw, and just pump it out and bottle it and sell it. And <laughs> I needed some. I'm thirsty. But, you know, so in any case, that, that's the market is um, the mechanism, you know, and uh, the idea of like, you know, if I could have had a scene where blood was being bought and sold or kidneys or whatever, sure, I would have had it in the film. I, the idea, the overall frame was that, that the market would absorb anything. Uh, I'll let you pick. <laughs> um, so in the film, uh, Memo's dad had that line about finding a future with a past, and it was repeated at the end of the film. So I was kind of wondering what the significance of that was and what you kind of meant with that phrase. Mm. What did it mean to you? or What did, what did you think? Um, well, I thought that because at the end of the film, it kind of goes back to, I guess, like simpler times. So it was kind of showing that this advent, or not advent, but this like climax of technology kind of taking over everything wouldn't work out to in the future. And it's kind of like you're insinuating that people need to maybe disconnect a little bit and go back to the roots, but I don't know. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, to me, I love the word the future. It's one of those words that's like deceptively simple. You know, it's like indicates a time frame, just like now we're in the future. You know what I mean? It's just... But it's also so many other things, right? It's obviously the m more powerful usages of the future mean things like hope. So if you say, oh, that guy's got no future, you don't mean he's literally not going to make it to tomorrow. You mean he's not, you know, not, there's not a lot of hope there, you know? So the future's a kind of synonym for hope. Um, you know, images that are futuristic is another angle on that question. So if you think about futuristic images or uh, often we think of skyscrapers or flying cars or these kind of like explosions of, of capital and, you know, industrial innovation. In reality, you know, 
uh, a river is something we need more in, in the future than a, a flying car, you know what I mean? Or mm. a tree is something we need more than a skyscraper, you know? And so um, Memo's dad is kind of playing with all of that and saying like, you know, is our future a thing of the past and the beginning? Saying like, is our hope is our hope, did our hope go, is our hope gone? You know, is our ability to find power and independence, is that gone, you know? And so that's the future he's talking about. And then, um, and then Memo is kind of riffing off that at the end. But, um, but throughout the film, I did want to kind of invert or play with those ideas that maybe the milpa is, you know, more crucial or more, might provide more hope than the factory, the high-tech factory. You know, there's two ways of, what, what, what's the goal? I mean, what's our goal? What's all of this stuff for? The goal is to sustain ourselves, to live, to be happy, to be together. I mean, these are the objectives of the human experience, is to, like, be together and love each other and, you know, live and thrive, but not, you know what I mean? Like, that's what all of the stuff we build should be about, you know, and what really gets us there. And maybe, you know, and I'm not trying to be, um, super naive or romantic, but I do think there's ways in which like systems of living that we destroy constantly and replace with others, you know, it might be that what we've destroyed was actually more futuristic or uh, maybe offered a, a path forward more than the thing that's being celebrated as futuristic and inevitable. You know, GMO foods and etc. one example, but anyways. So um, in the film, you chose mostly to portray the Mexican side of the border, and you kind of left out a lot of context about our side. Why is that, and where do you imagine the U.S. would be in, in the future world you've created? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that was on purpose, man. I mean, partly uh, two, two reasons. One was to flip the script and, and to uh, do a science fiction that shows where the stuff comes from, you know? It's like in Steven Spielberg movies, like Wash, you know, Minority Report, you know, flying you know, cars drive up sides of skyscrapers and everyone's driving really fast and there's no traffic jams in the future. How'd that happen? I don't know, you know what I mean? But, or Blade Runner, like Los Angeles is, where, but where's all the stuff come from? You know what I mean? Where, wherever there's a skyscraper, there's a hole in the ground. Somewhere, you know what I mean? Um, our iPhones are scraped out of the earth. I mean, the rare earths that power the, the iPhones are, you know, there's been all this fascinating reporting on the mines where all of our technology, the, the core uh, elements come from. And there's just incredibly dystopic scenes of people just scraping with the practically fingernails these elements out of the earth, you know, to make the, uh, the, the iPad, you know. And uh, so part of it was to say I wanted to look at a place that is thought of as the periphery. I don't, I reject that. I think that that's actually the center, you know, the, but a place that in our cinematic history and our history of thinking about the future has been off of the stage. So I want to set the story there. Number two is I was cheap. I didn't have any money, you know what I mean? And so there's a nice, like, kind of poetic um, exchange there between a political gesture of looking at the periphery and then a budgetary gesture of, like, I don't have money to visualize Steven Spielberg's future, so I'm going to visualize my future, you know, the future of the people that, that I love. And, you know, un unfortunately, uh, you know, some of that, I think that is, there is the shanty town, there is the barrio, there is the border wall. These are elements in the, you know, in the world I'm looking at. And they're extraordinary visual elements, you know, and they're already there, you know. And so I was able to kind of, the idea was to do a lot of, photography of existing landscapes to be cheap. We have time for maybe a couple more uh, questions, I think. Um, so I have a question in regard to a detail thing. Um, so like in the movie, you have like those fully like armed guards and you have the like the DNA and the identification scene. So it's like, um, so it's pretty high tech everything, but like um, the access like to the factory is kind of like a four digit code, like password. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> I'm just like curious if there are any like implication about that, except like um, it's like easy to access. <laughs> like um, I'm thinking about like um, 
So they're like regard them as like low level workers. So they pose no threats, like compared to um, like you build a like a wireless thing and that like you intersect something and they send out like drones to like to attack you. Yeah. That's a, I mean, I, thank you for the details. <laughs> <laughs> you were paying attention. You know, that's super good. No, I mean, I, um, you just got to wing it sometimes. I, I, I needed him to be able to kind of like get the boss's code to get out the back door to let his friends in. And so he's going to, you know, so it's had him look at the code and it was short. For what it's worth, I had the code is 1994. That's what I had him type yeah. in the pad, which is the year of NAFTA passing and the year the border wall was first constructed and the year the Zapatistas emerged. So there's a little story. But <laughs> <laughs> other, other than that, you just, you know, you caught me. <laughs> other than that, yeah. So uh, a personal question. Um, if you don't mind. Mm. So this, this movie is about memories and it seems to be a really big deal uh, as part of your own career. I'm just wondering if there's any sort of personal memory or personal memento or something that you save from doing this movie that's important to you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I have, um, I have the node gun, you know, this like the, the prop is, and I love it because it's, um, the production designer had this kind of moment of, uh, brilliance to it's it's um it's one of the it's like a pneumatic gun for taking nuts off of a, a car you know like a when you get your hubcaps or not your 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 rims or whatever zzz, 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 that you know he dipped it in chrome and tricked it out but i love that it was like coming straight out of like you know out of the garage and into the future and mm -hmm. so i have i mean so there's those kinds of momentum but most of the the real like powerful keepsakes are just up here in terms of um was it like a story on the set or something? That yeah, I mean, just, I mean, there's many, it's, I mean, don't get me started, but it, it was a really, it was a very, very crazy and powerful experience. This, one of the most interesting moments, though, was, when it, you know, was on the set in um, the factory set, which we built in Mexico City, and, uh, you know, that, that, fa that set, um, I'd looked at reference photos of factories around the world, and to get the kind of scale, you know, you needed 20 workers. Everywhere I was looking at these photos, I was seeing at least minimum rows of 20, and 20 workers and so I'd asked production for 20 and 20 workers and they said okay and then like a week later said we can't afford it we could do 10 and 10 I said, all right and then eventually said eight and eight and then eventually got down to four and four so that set is smaller than this stage I mean substantially smaller it's just four people standing like that and four people here and uh, and then so we put a mirror there you know and so then you get like then you get eight and then we draped ourselves in green all of us in green, so we're in the mirror, and then you know take the whole thing digitally and shrink it down. But I was there in in the set, and then you know the wires though there was no you can't we weren't going to um, paint them in digitally, so we did that op that's all real, and it's just makeup glue you can see it it's you know it's a little cheesy but it's makeup glue on their skin. But then I had this idea of these spider like machines like I wanted them to look like puppets where you didn't know if they were being controlled or controlling you know. And so these spring-loaded metal arms with this cable going down glued onto people's skin, and they'd be doing their thing, and then they'd go like, you'd hear someone go, ah! And their skin would come flying off. <laughs> it's like, patch of skin flying off. And I'm sitting here like, I'm trying to make, uh, and people get paid no money. I mean, it, it's a low-budget film. It's no joke. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking like, I'm trying to make something sympathetic about you know, making something thoughtful about the workers' <laughs> plight. And I'm like, people's skin getting flicked off <laughs> left and right. And then, I, and then on the news, I was reading about, you know, in 2006, this, as we were filming, it was one of these immigrant rights marches. I don't know if folks remember, but it was really like a transformative moment in the beginning of the kind of more, um, you know, a powerful movement for, for, for justice and dignity for immigrants in this country. It sort of erupted right then. And I was just like, what am I doing? I'm like in this weird warehouse in Mexico City, torturing people, and then up, up there, people are like, you know, doing something normal, like marching in the streets <laughs> to, to make the world a slightly better place. And you know, you have a kind of crisis about like, what, you know, who, who am I, why am I, but... Um, well, you made an awesome <laughs> message, so thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, I think uh, we're about out of time. Uh, so uh, uh, thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.